Have you ever felt constrained while using your money? Dash allows you to instantly send and receive secure digital payments with near zero fees anytime, anywhere. It's fast, it's secure, it's borderless. There are thousands of businesses that accept Dash. Buy anything online or in store. Send money home to your loved ones with ease at a much lower cost than traditional remittance services. <laughs> Just download your free digital wallet at Dash.org and start sending and receiving money in minutes. Dash is digital cash. Hi, everybody. Once again, welcome to Dash Brazil. Today, we have the pleasure once again to have Mark Yusko for uh, Morgan Creek Capital Management. Mark, welcome. How are you? Oh, doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Always great to, to catch up. All right. So I, I don't even know where we can begin, but uh, let, let's start with uh, $27 trillion or trillions in debt. Stock market at all-time high. Oil went negative. I didn't even know this was possible. Yeah. Fed printer getting ready to fire up again. Stock buybacks are pretty much great if you are a CEO and you get a lot of bonus. Yep. Airline industry asking for more money and still got to fire thousands of people. Uh, FinCEN papers reveals banks laundry over $2 trillion in 10 years. There's a new Cold War based on data. There's a virus which now became a political virus. 27 days uh, before the election, democracy at the edge. And we're in the middle of a world crisis, beginning of a depression. Basically, capitalism at its prime. Yes. And, and nobody's listening. Where, where do we go from here? What's, what's, what's coming ahead? Look, you, you summarized it all really beautifully. And uh, I've been using an analogy recently that, that came from a, a trip that we made. So... Uh, my daughter just had a baby, so our second grandchild just arrived a couple weeks ago, and we took a six-week excursion where we drove from North Carolina uh, all the way to California, uh, stopping in Oklahoma for her dad's 84th birthday, uh, did a little sightseeing along the way, went to the Grand Canyon, and then uh, drove back uh, all throughout the southern states. And a couple takeaways. So one was the analogy I'm using is the Grand Canyon, the, the canyon between the haves and the have nots between Main Street and Wall Street is the biggest and deepest it's, it's ever been. And it's not getting better. This this myth that there's a recovery uh, on Main Street is exactly that. It's a myth, right? I, I went through 14 states over six weeks. The pain and suffering that I saw along the way was was catastrophic. Uh, the homelessness in, in every city. I mean, cities that you wouldn't expect. Nashville, Tennessee, massive tent cities. Uh, Austin, Texas, huge tent cities. Santa Monica, they've had homeless uh, problems for a long time. Um, but the, the most painful part of the trip, Rod, was uh, going to traditional tourist locations like Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the Grand Canyon itself, and basically seeing no people, no tourists, and talking to the locals, you know, Santa Fe was the saddest. I mean, the hotel we stayed in, which I, I've been to many times uh, for conferences where it's been packed to the gills, five cars in the parking lot. The hotel next door, three cars, a big sign saying, yes, we're, we're actually open. Um, and one out of three businesses boarded up. Uh, the shopkeepers we could find to talk to uh, basically saying, look, I tried, but I'm going to be bankrupt at the end of the summer. Uh, it's over. And uh, then you go to Grand Canyon, you know, the lodge we stayed at, two cars in the parking lot, uh, nobody there, um, just, just really horrifying. And yet there's this, you know, all glee about, you know, all-time highs in stocks. Well, it's just money illusion. So, yes, yeah, stock prices, nominal prices are high. But if you denominate that, not, that nominal price in anything other than U.S. dollars, uh, it's a very different picture. So over the last two years, yes, stocks are up about you know fifteen, sixteen percent, which isn't really that much, but but it's not terrible, uh, about six, seven percent a year. Um, but if you denominate it in gold, you're down forty four percent. If you denominate in you know even better currency, Bitcoin, you're down you know ninety plus percent. So this idea that 
that there is increase in value uh, is is just money illusion, right? The the Fed and the powers that be are devaluing their currencies all around the world. So it's not just the Fed; it's the Bank of Japan, it's the ECB. Uh, everybody is devaluing the currency. We're in a massive race to the bottom, and it's just a giant kleptocracy. All the money is funneling up to the top. The rich get super rich. And you and I know how this ends, right? We've seen it in Argentina, in Zimbabwe, in Venezuela. Uh, the dictators get rich and the people suffer. And, and that's where we're headed. And it's, it's frightening to see that happening here in the good old US of A, but uh, it, was, it was an ugly, ugly picture painted uh, on, on the trip. And uh, at the moment, we've seen stock market reflecting based on Twitter. Like, you know, the power of a single Twitter from the president can bring the stock market up and down, you know. And, and, yeah. and people are just quiet, even though there's some protests in a couple of states. Are, are we at the edge of having a, a massive revolution starting inside the U.S.? Or people are just going to accept <sighs> this calmly and, and it's just how I, it is? Yeah, I, I, I don't think we're... I don't think we're a revolutionary type, unfortunately. I, 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 wish, I wish we were. I wish people would stand up and, and, and fight back. Although the easiest way to do that is just vote, right? Uh, if, if the average person actually votes this election, uh, we'll get an outcome that I think can, can help change things, uh, maybe not to a normal path, but, but at least to the, to the less just horrific four years we've had in terms of, of just a rape and pillage of, of the common person. And what's really kind of funny is, is those people actually support the current administration, which, which makes no sense. I mean, if I were running for president, which I'm not, but if, if I were, uh, it'd be really simple, right? Are you better off than you were four years ago? And 99% of people in the country can't say yes. Think about that. 99% of people have to say, nope, I'm not better off than I was four years ago. So that's a very sad state. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think, unfortunately, we're, we're going to you know, come to arms, although we've come pretty close in, in some places. And there's been you know, plenty of, of horrific examples of, of abuse and brutality. And, and I think that is probably a bigger issue that's going to push us to that revolution you speak of. But when it comes to being kind of robbed of your wealth, uh, it's like it's like the frog in the pot, right? You're, you're boiled alive, but it happens so slowly. But by the time you realize it's happening, your muscles are paralyzed and you can't jump out. Um, so that that's kind of where we are is people are just and, and I saw an amazing tweet this morning, actually not from the tweeter in chief, but somebody saying, you know, we can solve this whole problem. You know, just just pass a, a bill that, that gives everybody five hundred dollars a month uh, through the end of the year. I'm like. What we, we've turned into Argentina and Venezuela, where we just buy votes. I mean, that's that's crazy. I mean, you remove all the incentive to to create and innovate and build businesses. You want people to sit at home and, and take money from the government and print money uh, at the Treasury. That's, it reminds me of the scene in WALL-E, the kids movie, where the, the great big movie, giant, by the way. The great giant people are sitting on their floating lounge chairs on the ship, basically watching, you know, TV and, and being hypnotized and just, you know, doing nothing. And, uh, you know, that's not a world in which I want to live. So, pretty and, sad. And how do you see this quiet revolution happening with cryptocurrencies? And I'm talking about Bitcoin, yeah. Ethereum, Dash, Digital Cash. How, what's yeah. the big role this is, this is going to play? play in, in the economy worldwide. Yeah, it's a, it's a great it's a great descriptor, a silent revolution because it's exactly what it is and you know, if you want to fight back against theft uh, of your your wealth, the best way to do that is to own a stable, you know, money. And gold historically has been that for about 5000 years. Uh, as we go from the analog age, I mean gold is is a physical analog thing. Now it's been turned into an electronic thing. You can actually buy QCIPs in the stock market that, that reflect underlying ownership of gold. So it's gone from the, the analog age to the electronic age. But now we've got the digital age. And the digital age allows us to have digital currencies and, and cryptocurrencies. 
Uh, and accordingly, there's only about a dozen or so. You mentioned four of them. Uh, it has to be something that is a medium of exchange or a store of value. All those other listed coins, you know, which are affectionately called shit coins, are, are utility tokens. And, and there's nothing inherently evil about a utility token. It's just that you don't have a claim on cash flows. You don't have an ownership of equity or debt. And the vast majority of those projects will, will go bust. Now, the ones that don't go bust, you can, you can actually make a lot of money. But it's basically like punting in venture capital. Unless you really know your tech, you're, you're just going to lose a lot of money. Uh, or you're very nimble at trading, and then you might be able to make some money. But, but cryptocurrencies are a true form of, of revolution because you can take depreciating assets, U.S. dollars, euros, yen, that are being devalued every single day. Uh, I always ask people, think about the lowest price you remember for a gallon of gas, right? For me, I'm an old guy. It was 31 cents back growing up in, in Totem Lake uh, near Seattle. And uh, I was just down in California visiting my daughter, right? I paid $4.30 for a gallon of gas. Now, it's the same gallon of gas. It does the exact same thing, right? Produces the same amount of heat, actually a little less because now it's got ethanol in it. Um, but I paid, you know, 12, 13 times as much. That's ridiculous. Why did I do that? Well, because of inflation, that, that silent theft. So by moving some of your assets, and I'm not saying all of your assets, but some of your assets into cryptocurrencies, particularly things like Bitcoin or Dash or others, you are preserving that capital from the devaluation of your fiat currency. And look, once we went off the gold standard in 79, we, we just had this massive kleptocracy that occurs and it siphons the money from the most vulnerable, the poor and the middle class, and siphons it up to the rich because the rich own all the assets. And, and that's the way the world works. And that's why the system everywhere around the world is designed to propagate this myth that inflation is good, that fiat currencies are good, that control, central bank control of fiat currencies is good, none of which are true unless you're part of that elite group. But if you're part of the regular working class, it's horrible. And that's why we have this you know, highest wealth and income inequality in the history of mankind. It's why we have the pain and suffering that, that I saw on this long trip. And it's why we are right back in, in Hooverville, uh, which I actually wrote about four years ago as, as Trump was, was moving toward election and saying, look, if the guy gets elected, you know, he'll only be the third president we've ever had that has no experience. He'll probably do as bad a job as Hoover did and we'll end up with, with tent cities called Hoovervilles. And, and here we are. So it's kind of crazy. And how do, how do you see now the desperation act of central banks trying to win this race about creating their own digital currency? And let, let phrase this correct. It's a digital currency. It's not a cryptocurrency from central correct. banks. Correct. Very, very important. You're one of the few people that, that correctly makes that distinction. A digital currency is not a cryptocurrency. A digital currency is just a digital form of fiat, right? We used to have analog fiat. We had these dollars, these paper dollars or, or coins, and then we turned it into electronic. Now, 92% of all money is electronic. In fact, I have this recurring nightmare, Rod, that I, I wake up in a little cold sweat because I go to the ATM and I go to take money out and it says zero. I'm like, well, how would I prove it's not zero? I don't have a paper statement anymore. It's their word against mine, and it's just ones and zeros in a computer. There's no physical hard currency anymore. So that electronic money can be digitized. We could have a digital dollar or a digital renminbi. In fact, we probably will have a digital renminbi maybe as early as first quarter next year. Um, but it's not a cryptocurrency. A cryptocurrency is a separate system. It's a defined system where there's a finite amount, which is the key point. You know, With fiat, you can create money by fiat, by decree, out of thin air. Literally, you can just create more. So if, if we had a million dollars here between us and somebody printed another million dollars, what happens to the value of that million dollars? It goes down by half. I mean, there, there's more money chasing the same amount of goods. Now, in theory, if you print more money, you can create more goods and services. So that, that is a compelling argument. And that's why I'm not one of these haters of the idea of fractional reserve banking. I actually like the idea, if you look around the world, the economies that are the best have fractional reserve banking systems. The ones that aren't as good have really bad banking systems. So I'm not 
against banks per se. What I'm against is the central bank role of, of how money is created and distributed to the, the wealthy, right? The central banks print the money. They give it to the primary dealers, which are controlled by the rich guys. Those guys sell it to the treasury for a profit and so bails out the banks. But none of that money gets its way into middle America. No lending is occurring. No growth is occurring. No innovation is occurring. So no wealth creation is occurring. So that devalues that currency, whether it's analog form, electronic form, or digital form. Fiat is fiat, and it's bad. And a cryptocurrency allows you to opt out of the fiat fiasco and have an asset that there's a fixed supply. And it says, oh, we can create lots of cryptocurrencies. No, no, you can't, right? Each cryptocurrency has a use base, a user base, and has a use case, right? It can either be used as a medium of exchange, right? And Bitcoin, for example, is not a good medium of exchange. It's too slow. And people say, oh, well, that's horrible. I'm like, no, it's a feature, not a bug, right? In a, in a network, you have to choose speed or security. The Visa network is very fast, can process lots of transactions, but it gets hacked all the time because it's not very secure. So how many times have you had to get a new Visa or MasterCard number because your number got stolen? So it's not secure, but it's very fast. Well, that's fine. That's, that's one form of network. For a store of value network, you need it to be immutable and very secure. You know, the Bitcoin blockchain, been up for almost 11 years, has never been hacked. Not one fraudulent transaction, not one. Think about that. Hundreds of billions of transactions, not one fraudulent transaction. So it is very, very secure. Now it's very slow. So how do we fix that? Well, we create a stack of protocols on top of it to do transactions. If you think about it, what is Visa? Visa is just a spreadsheet and it tracks my usage of money over the course of a month. And then we settle up once a month and we send some money from my bank to them that they send to the merchants. So it's basically just a big spreadsheet, but it's very convenient. And I like using it rather than taking money out of my pocket. Uh, but now I like digital currencies even better because they are a more efficient system even than electronic. It's a direct peer-to-peer -peer payment system. And whether it's Lightning Network or other second layer or third layer systems that, that come on in the future, things like Dash, things like Monero, all of these things will find their role in this digital world. So it's a really long answer to a really important point that digital currencies are just the digital form of the digital evolution of fiat, which is a bad thing. And cryptocurrencies are the new, new thing. And I talk about the X factor, right? At the beginning in 1970 or 19, uh, um, sorry, 2009, there were no cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrency was down here at the bottom and everything was fiat. Now fiat is slowly going to go down and crypto is eventually going to go up. And at the end, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it is, we'll all use cryptocurrencies. Uh, we will all transact over the internet of value using the operating system that is likely to be Bitcoin or, or some other variant of that. Um, but it's very exciting when you think about it as a technological evolution of the operating system of computing power, which is exactly what cryptocurrencies are. And is it possible to have a, a country, a state, a government run its economy, but without a central bank? Is this the idea out there or this is being scratched out for a long time ago? Uh, look, think about it. Uh, crypto is borderless. It doesn't need a nation state to exist. And governments are actually powerless against it once people opt out of government controlled systems. They can't seize it, right? They can't stop it. And everybody says, oh, the government's going to shut it down anytime they want. They've tried and they can't. And that's the beauty of a decentralized network. If you go back to the original days of, of electronic going to digital. So I use songs, right? If I have a song and in the old days I had the analog version, I had the record. Most people don't even know what a record is or a CD or a cassette tape or an eight track. I had an analog physical thing. If I wanted to let you use it, I had to get with you in, in close proximity. I had to hand it to you. Um, and you could make a recording of a record with a cassette player, but we both had to have analog physical devices. Then we came to the MP3 age, and now I had an electronic version of that song. And if I wanted to give you a copy of it, you actually didn't care if you got the copy or the original. 
because the copy played just as fine. Now, the record industry cared. The music industry cared because they want you to buy your own original. So when Napster set up to allow file sharing, song sharing, it was a centralized system. It was a hierarchy. It had one CEO, one home office, one server. So what do you do? You want to kill a centralized organization, right? You kidnap the CEO, blow up the, the home office, or you arrest the CEO and blow up the server, which is exactly what they did. So the government shut down Napster. Well, if you have a decentralized network, now what do you do? Well, there is no CEO. In fact, there's the joke about when Zuck was testifying to Congress about, about Libra. They said, well, you know, Congress subpoenaed the CEO of Bitcoin, but, but they're still unavailable. Uh, no one knows where they are. And not only is there no CEO to arrest, but which server do you blow up? You can blow up one of the 9,000 or, or 900 of the 9,000, but you're never going to find all 9,000. And it's a self-healing network. And so the idea of decentralization is nirvana to this idea of centralized control. It's why governments don't like it very much. And it's, it's why ultimately, look, good technology, despite being despised and loathed and hated, always wins. You know, there were people who didn't want to have, you know, cars because they had jobs, you know, sweeping, you know, horse poop. I always say, do, do people know why the stoops of homes in downtown New York are nine feet above street level? And he says, no, why? Like horse poop. Like, what are you talking about? Well, they used to, you know, push the poop to the side and it used to stack three, four feet high. And the ladies didn't want their dresses dragging in the poop. So they built the sidewalks nine feet up and the stoops of the homes had to be on the sidewalks. So then when the horse's carriage came along, the street sweeper said, oh, you don't want to get in that car. You'll die. Well, what do you mean you'll die? Right. Or when people, when the airplane first came out, people said, oh, you can't get in that because once you go past a certain miles per hour, your body will cave in on itself. Crazy. So all these things are created because people hate change because it threatens their jobs and their livelihoods. And the banks, they don't want to be displaced. They've had a pretty good run for, you know, about a thousand years. And uh, they really like, you know, being in charge. But this idea that we can be bankless, that we can bank ourselves through crypto is a is a pretty compelling and it's a it's a natural evolution of technology that is inevitable it will happen and it doesn't mean that banks will disappear we'll still need banks to do lending and we'll still need banks to you know, we're probably going to have digital currencies or digital fiat to go along with crypto at the core but but the idea that we're moving to a global borderless world and nation states will become less important systems, global systems will become more important. And you can be a citizen of the world as opposed to being just a citizen of a single nation state. That's kind of cool. And, and what's the role that Morgan Creek Digital is playing in this future ahead that you guys uh, started a yeah, couple of years ago? We're a, we're a, yeah, we're a little tiny player, but we're trying hard. Um, we've raised about a little over $100 million to invest in companies that are building out the infrastructure of this digital age. And uh, it's been a blast and, and really, really loving it. Um, you know, we've invested with some just amazing entrepreneurs and some great businesses, uh, companies like Figure Technologies and BlockFi uh, that are really basically taking simple ideas. You know, Figure attacks this idea that, you know, the DTCC, um, the Trezor Trust settles every, you know, physical, securities transaction and why do we still use 400 year old technology why are there paper stock certificates why are there paper bond certificates why isn't every stock every bond every currency every commodity digitized and tokenized that will occur and by building the platform on which all those digital transactions will settle you can build a pretty valuable business or, or BlockFi, which you know don't call it a bank but it's basically a bank for digital assets uh, they take deposits, they make loans, they act like a bank, but they're called blockchain financial, uh, not a bank because the banks don't like it. And uh, it, it is the future, right? People will convert fiat assets into crypto assets or digital assets. They'll deposit those digital assets and then they will use those digital assets to lend and to build businesses and to uh, create value. And, and look, at the end of the day, entrepreneurs are, are gonna build things and uh, financiers are going to finance them and technologists are going to are going to innovate and build build new ideas and, and integrate those new ideas into 
replacements for the old traditional ways of doing things. And, and every time we've done that, we've, we've advanced society. And so fighting against it <laughs> seems kind of silly, um, but there are still people fighting against it. So at Morgan Creek Digital, our job is, is simply to facilitate these, these rogue entrepreneurs. I call them rogues because that's what the, the you know, view of the world is that, um, and look, every uh, new idea um, begins with broken precedent, uh, the Will Durant quote. Um, every custom begins with broken precedent. So what, what seemed like the custom at one point in life just goes away because people realize it wasn't true. And whether it's, you know, the flat earth and, and Galileo and, and being ostracized because he said, hey, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I'm not the center of the universe. Um, or whether it was, you know, Thomas Edison inventing electric light bulb. Uh, my favorite quote from him is, you know, I didn't, I never failed. I just found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. Uh, and I think the same thing's true here is we've had lots of, of false starts along the way toward this, this crypto capitalism as I like to call it, uh, that replaces the crony capitalism, right? We don't have capitalism anymore. We have crony capitalism and it's this dictator playbook and this kleptocracy that exists and it's perverted traditional capitalism for the benefit of, of the few at the expense of the many. Crypto capitalism liberates us back to a, a free and, and just society um, where you know people can can be rewarded for saving, not consuming, for creating value instead of destroying value. Um, so it's it's pretty exciting time to be involved. I I'm more energized than I was uh, uh, 20 years ago. I can't say that uh, you know Walter Reed made me 20 years younger like uh, our tweeter in chief did, but uh, I can say that that hanging out with with young people that that are visionary and uh, this high level of enthusiasm uh, really uh, is is great, and it it uh, you know it allows me to keep up with my nine year old. So that's good. Well, we definitely have a lot of turbulence coming, but we have a great future ahead uh, with technology. Mark Yusko, once again, always a pleasure to have you here. I hope to catch you another time soon. See you later. No, oh, thanks, Rod. Great to be with you. Dash launched in 2014 as a more scalable version of Bitcoin, but. Even with scaling advancements, early Dash users realized that basic blockchain technology isn't suitable for the kinds of payments applications that you and I use every day, like paying our friends and family by username, or getting rewarded for shopping with our favorite merchants, or having global login credentials that allow us to easily create new accounts all across the web. The Dash network realized then that in order to become the best payment option, it needed to be more than just a scalable blockchain. It needed to become compatible with web technologies that users and developers are already familiar with. In short, it needed to become a cloud. So with that goal in mind, the Dash network announced in late 2015 that it would undergo an evolution. Fast forward to today, and the Dash Network is preparing to deploy the largest and final installment of that evolution. It's called Dash Platform. Dash Platform is made up of four components, which together will make Dash the first peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency that functions like a cloud service. This means the world's first decentralized HTTP API, blockchain verified storage of user data, human readable usernames working on top of cryptographic addresses, and more. How can the things I've just mentioned possibly run on a decentralized blockchain when we all know they've only been available from centralized services in the past? Great question. And the answer can be found in each of the following four videos where you will learn about Drive, the decentralized API, usernames via the Dash platform name service, and the Dash platform protocol. So stay tuned, because Dash is becoming a decentralized cloud.